The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm pleased we could all uh, attend today for this short course on the topic of surface interactions on Mars. I'm a JPL engineer and one of the deputy co-leads of, uh, of the KISS study on exoterra mechanics. I want to take a moment to uh, describe the study to you as well as the motivations for our short course this morning. We are here to learn about the physical interaction of our man-made engineered systems with the harsh and often unknown environments found in extraterrestrial bodies. The canonical case that many of us are familiar with is that of driving robots, uh, robotic rovers over the train of Mars. While our missions there have been astoundingly successful, it is still issues related to mobility that drive both our science objectives and our mission lifetime. So to enhance our capabilities to model, simulate, and design for these scenarios, we are holding several week-long uh, events this summer, which this is the first day of the first workshop. We have many JPLers and Caltechers uh, present, as well as attendees from other NASA centers, uh, academia, and industry. This short course is intended to provide our technically diverse uh, participants with an overview of the various essential elements of uh, terra mechanics on planetary bodies. Uh, because before we dive into a week of discussion, we want to establish kind of a common vocabulary uh, before uh, we go forward. So we're also very pleased uh, that we're able to make this course open to the, uh, the public and, and engineering communities. Uh, and that everyone has been able to squeeze into the room today. So I'll briefly go over the outline and show you how it all ties together. Ray, will first, uh, Ray Arvidsson will first motivate us with an overview of how we currently do science and geology on Mars. And then Bob Anderson will go further into depth about the types of materials we encounter, their mechanical properties, how we characterize them, and even simulate them here on Earth. Jose Andrade will then take us through the basics of soil mechanics, uh, which will lead into the equations of Terra mechanics. This is a field of semi-empirical equations that has been developed to uh, predict the mobility of ve uh, wheeled vehicles uh, in soft terrains. Carl Yanema will cover this topic and its ever-increasing extension to planetary explorations. My co-deputy from Caltech, Ivan Vahinich, and I will take turns introducing our speakers, and I'll begin right now with our first speaker, Ray Arvidsson. Ray was uh, educated as a geologist at Temple and Brown University. He's currently chair of the Department of uh, Earth and Planetary Sciences at Washington University in St. Louis, where he's been since the 70s and received numerous research and teaching awards. Ray is uh, known around here at JPL and Caltech in many roles including that of Deputy Principal Investigator of the Murr Rovers and Co-Investigator on the Phoenix Landers Robotic Arm. He is also head of NASA's Planetary Data System Geosciences <coughs> Node, which collects and processes the many terabytes of data that our planetary missions send back to Earth. His research interest is in remote sensing. He's written numerous articles and books on that dealing with Earth, Mars, and Venus. Ray led an effort that started with an assessment of the spirit uh, embedding incident on Mars two years ago, which has brought about this community and workshop that is gathering here today. <coughs> However, I would say that neither the recent decision to end Spirit's mission nor the occurrence of this workshop is the culmination of this effort. Rather, uh, Ray continues to motivate the field of terra mechanics so that we can assist Spirit's sister opportunity on her steep ascent uh, to the Rim of Endeavor crater as well as guide MSL's curiosity as she faces mobility challenges unlike those that our rovers have seen so far. So I'm gonna go over some of what we're doing in terms of remote sensing of Mars, but it's a huge field. So what I'm gonna to try to do is focus it down to of relevance to terra mechanics in terms of material properties and focus it down to a tactical issue and that is opportunity is less than 3,000 meters from the rim of a 20,000 meter crater called Endeavor. And if we get there and get into those rocks, we'll be looking at ancient rocks that we have not seen before. And we think there are clay minerals exposed on the rim. We've been traversing more than seven and a half years across Meridiani Planum, looking at ancient lake beds. But if we can get to Endeavor, we can get to the rim and make measurements. We'll be in a new geologic environment and be able to go back and try to reconstruct environmental conditions older than anything we've seen so far with opportunity. 
So what I'll do is focus in on how we're using remote sensing uh, to get at the properties and to help the rover planners direct the vehicle to the right outcrops on the rim of Endeavour, rather than trying to cover all of remote sensing, which takes a semester. And I am going to motivate you guys per instructions. So we've been doing a lot of coordinated observations between Opportunity and orbital assets, beginning with the Mars Express and the Mars Global Surveyor, with Mars Express in terms of Omega, which is the French hyperspectral imager that operates from 0.4 to 5 micrometers, and looking at the mineralogy that one can retrieve from those observations to help understand from a broader context laterally uh, what opportunity is seeing. So those are coordinated observations. But what I want to focus on is Odyssey, which is another orbiter. It's a NASA orbiter, and particularly the Themis instrument, which operates both in the visible and the infrared, thermal infrared. In particular, retrieval of thermal inertia, which is related to the thermal physical properties of the surface, ultimately grain size distribution, and the degree of cohesion of the material. So it has definite impact on terra mechanical properties. Um, so what the orbital observations do is allow us to retrieve properties beyond where the rover has been, and it also feeds into mobility issues. And the rover planners use orbital data for opportunity every planning cycle in terms of morphology and likely properties, looking at the surface views and then the orbital views together, particularly high rise, as we'll see in a minute. So Opportunity is way beyond warranty, right? So this was a vehicle that we thought would last maybe 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. So let's see, Paolo or Ashley, what are we planning today? So 2000... It's been so long we can't even count. It's in the 2000s. So it's way out of warranty, but still in darn good shape for your great-grandfather's version of a rover. And that we still have six-wheel drive, although this wheel is rotated in because of a failed azimuthal actuator about eight degrees. So it does tend to torque the, um, the motions a little bit. Uh, six-wheel drive vehicle, the four outer wheels also have azimuthal actuators except for this guy. A five-degree robotic arm, the instrument deployment device which has a close-up imager. It has a rock abrasion tool with a brush and the ability to grind into rocks. It has an alpha particle X-ray spectrometer, which gives elemental composition. It has a Mossbauer spectrometer, which gives the iron oxidation state and also the presence and relative abundance of iron-bearing minerals. Surprisingly, we also use the APXS occasionally when we're not doing other things to point up at the atmosphere and we can measure the content of argon which seems interesting because we didn't go to Mars to do atmospheric measurements. But what we're seeing is argon concentration relative to the overall CO2 changes as a function of season, particularly as the argon is brought with the carbon dioxide into the condensing south polar cap. We see a minimum of argon, and then it comes back when the spring comes back in terms of the seasons. Panoramic camera with multispectral capability from 0.4 to 1 micrometer. It's also stereo. Navcam for navigation, it's panchromatic. Unfortunately, many tests, the emission spectrometer, which is important in terms of thermal physical properties and mineralogy, and operated from, from about 5 to 29 micrometers, hasn't worked for a while. It's non-responsive. But generally, we've got a good package, instrument package, and good capability. And Paula, we drove just over 500 meters last week almost 600 meters. So we're going a little bit too fast, because I'm not sure I can get everything ready uh, in terms of what we're going to find at Endeavor. So we should slow down a little bit. So Odyssey, Themis is important, and it operates both in the visible and, for us, what's important, the thermal, and looking at heat emitted from the surface. And Multispectral capability is important in terms of the properties of the atmosphere uh, and also the properties of the surface. But it's not going to tell you mineralogy because it's subsampling spectrally the minimum features, the, the spectral features, the absorption features 
that you need to pick out the mineralogy. But it is good for thermal physical mapping, although importantly, the pixel size projected onto the surface is 100 meters. So we're not going to be able to see the vehicle, and it's about equal to the drive path for a given saw. So we have to keep that in mind when we're doing the, the mapping of properties. The Chrysomob instrument on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter gets down to 18 meters per pixel, and it is a hyperspectral imager, and it has 544 bands from uh, the just short word of visible out to almost four micrometers. Uh, context imager is more or less co-located with it, and it's panchromatic, operating at six meters per pixel. And high rise is our workhorse, 25 centimeters per pixel, and it operates um, in three bands, um, basically blue, green, red, and infrared. In theory, these are all co-located or nested, although they're bore sighted slightly differently, so you spend a lot of time doing co-registration. And secondly, both CTX and high-rise observations can be acquired from different orbits with parallax in order to extract topographic information. So we can get thermophysical properties, we can get mineralogy and inferences of grain sizes, we can get morphology, and we can get topography. High-rise is of crucial use in terms of path planning because you can see the vehicle and you can also see the path that you might want to avoid or take. The other is kind of a set of overlay, the over other data uh, onto this whole planning process, an inference of, of properties beyond where you've been. This is a geologic map of the, the overall region. Opportunity is more or less there. That's 20,000 meters. And what we're looking at, the, the units that are kind of blue and gray, that's the ancient terrain. What we think is, is back around 4 billion years ago, Mars was still being impacted, kind of sweeping up last bits of debris from accretion. It also had integrated channel systems, and you can see the remnants of these here. And this particular region, Meridiani Planum, is tilted to the northwest. And about, it turns out, the tilt of the Missouri River from um, Montana down to St. Louis. And this was a region of extensive erosion, a lot of uh, isolated plateaus. So we had a hydrologic system that was transferring a lot of mass into the plains. That changed, and it became a depositional center and this red unit, colored red, is actually about 300 meters worth of layered sedimentary rocks. And we've been investigating the surface of those, those exposures. And going into craters and looking at the stratigraphy, those are sulfates. Uh, there are various sulfate minerals mixed with silicates and silica. And the best interpretation is an ancient environment of deposition that represents occasional lakes, very salty, very acidic and then drying out, reconfiguring to sand dunes, to aeolian windblown ripples, and then the water table coming up, and then re-cementing things. And it probably represents a drying out phase of Mars, perhaps with the demise of the internal magnetic field as the core froze. Uh, but what's important is that we're here, and this thing called CS is actually a crater called Endeavor, 20,000 meters across. And in a few months, we'll be up to the rim of that crater, and it's part of this older assemblage. This guy called Bapalu uh, is actually a crater that punctured into everything, so it's younger. And we probably sampled the ejecta uh, when we first landed. But we're going to move from these younger rocks that are sitting on top of the older terrain to the rim of Endeavor sometime within the next few months. And that's kind of what I'm going to focus on in terms of what have we found using remote sensing from orbit and our surface assets in terms of um, the mineralogy, the texture for the planes, and what are we likely to find as we get to Endeavor's rim, and what are our targets? So it's kind of coordinated. So thermal inertia, as you folks probably know, is the square root of the product of the thermal conductivity and the heat capacity, and it's something we can derive from diurnal measurements. And the depth that you get in terms of the 1 over E folding of the temperature is related to the skin depth, it's related to the period. For, so for a diurnal cycle, you're sensing down to centimeters in depth. Uh, so you're integrating the estimate of thermal inertia based on that, that kind of depth probing. 
Thermophysically, it's dominated by thermal conductivity. So you can imagine bedrock has very good conductivity compared to loose, fine-grained materials where there aren't that many grain-to-grain -grain contacts. And as a consequence, heat can't transfer very quickly in through the system. So low thermal inertia soils, the lower probably the finer and the, the less degree of cohesion. Intermediate is kind of sand, and then you, when one makes it cohesive, starts to fill in the pores, and then it gets all the way to bedrock. The thermal inertia values for most of Mars indicate very fine-grained material for the bright areas, which is something in the silt to very fine sand size, to medium-sized sand for the darker areas. <clears throat> but it's complicated because there's a lot of crust, soil crusts covering the surface of Mars, and there are occasional outcrops that get of bedrock that get thermal inertias that are a factor of two to three higher. And this is a, a thermal inertia map uh, derived from Themis. It's color-coded. So we go from 130 to 375 thermal inertia units using SI. And what we're showing is the whole traverse of, of opportunity over 30,000 meters through when I gave up trying to do this uh, last Friday. And what's of interest, this is the rim of Endeavor. And you can see that it's pretty much buried by the plains materials. And we're on the way to Cape York and Botany Bay for reasons I'll tell you about in a few minutes. These light blue areas are low thermal inertia. Those are, are sand covered with hematitic concretions, not much bedrock exposed. And we traversed into this kind of yellow area, intermediate thermal inertia. And that's a mixture of very thin sands, some hematitic concretions that are about five millimeters across, and bedrock exposures. And that's the terrain that we're on now. But note that when we get to Botany Bay and Cape York, the thermal inertia is a lot higher. It's a lot higher. And we'll see from high rise, the reason for Botany Bay, which is the, the plains material surrounding the rim of Endeavor, the dissected rim of Endeavor, Botany Bay is is bedrock exposed for the most part, so it's higher. Still has some sand because it's not 800 units, which is pure bedrock, but we can see bedrock in high rise. And one of the issues is what's causing the signature in Cape York? Because we want to drive there because we think that's where the Noachian crust is exposed. It's the closest location from opportunity to endeavor. It's fairly easily traversed as compared to these rocks, Cape Tribulation is 80 meters high. Inboard, the slopes are 15 to 25 degrees. And that will present mobility difficulties. So we're going to do uh, Cape York first. This is a view from quite a while ago, Sol 2563. This is the view from PanCam. And it's not exaggerated, but there's Cape Tribulation. There's Solander Point. Botany Bay and Cape York are here. You can't actually see them from wherever they are. It, they don't have much relief, and they're tilted inboard on the crater. At some point, you know, if we get, I don't know, eight years' worth of, of measurements, we might try to do this ascent. But the interesting rocks are, are tilted in on the inboard toward the, the eastern side. And it's a mother load of a clay mineral called iron magnesium smectites based on identifications of combination bands that are iron magnesium attached to hydroxyls from chrism. But that is a tough place to get to and make measurements. This is backing up to daytime thermal imaging at about 3 in the afternoon local time. It's all dominated by topographic slopes, differential solar heating. Victoria is a crater we, in, we investigated over uh, the winter season, our winter season. And here's Endeavor. And we're headed for here. But Ada uh, is a crater that even the most optimistic person working on opportunity doesn't think we'll get to. Right? Be that's a joke, guys. That's 20 kilometers, OK? We're not going to get there. But we can visit it from orbit. And uh, that's what I'll show you next. Uh, and then some data from Santa Maria and Victoria. And then we'll wind up talking about Endeavor's rim. So that's. Ada from high rise. It's a relatively young impact crater. It's about 2.2 kilometers wide. And what's of interest are these bright rocks exposed on just beneath the rim on the inner wall. So we'll blow up the high rise to the next view, about 170 meters across. 
what is the mineralogy of these rocks? That was what was of interest to understand the stratigraphy, the layers that are exposed from these, these ancient lake beds that have been reworked and re-cemented. That's large enough to be sampled properly by CRISM's 18 meters per pixel, 544 bands. Uh, so that's what we'll begin with first. So this is a CRISM observation. You know, we're not looking at 25 centimeters per pixel, 18 meters per pixel of eta. And this is the sunlit part of those bright uh, wall rocks. And when you go in and pull out a reflectance spectrum, this is the amount of sunlight reflected versus wavelength from visible through about 2.55 micrometers. This is a, a tough retrieval to get because you have to model the gas band transmission losses in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, water vapor, carbon monoxide. You have to wor worry about scattering and absorption by dust aerosols in the atmosphere. You have to worry about how the surface scatters. So there's skylight, there are transmissive losses, there are additive features. So we use a radiative transfer code that's been proven for terrestrial work and also other planets called DISORT. And this is a, a, a retrieval for that spot, those bright rocks. And it's noisy because they're only a few pixels. Uh, and it, this 2.1 micrometer asymmetrical band is characteristic of a water a combination band in a magnesium sulfate lattice. And it's particularly one molecule of water in the, in the unit cell. It's keyserite, most likely. Whereas the left-hand side is dominated by iron oxides, electronic transitions. And the area surrounding uh, looks to be more electronic transition dominated and doesn't have this diagnostic feature. Well, that's nice. Uh, because what we wanted to do is, with a normal set of observations with CRISM, identify the, the nature, the spectral dominance in terms of mineralogy of this surface. So back last August, we realized the features that we're investigating with or from, uh, from the surface with opportunity are small compared to the pixel size of 18 meters. The way CRISM operates, the optics are on a gimbal. So what we do is coming across is actually change the, the pointing in order to get those 18 meters per pixel cheek to jowl. So we developed the technique with the, the actuators to actually oversample in the long track direction. And that allows you to actually do some sharpening, but at the expense of decreased signal to noise, right? because the system is designed for the 18 meters per pixel. But it's a technique that allows us to go in for, and examine relatively small features with the realization that our ability to extract fine spectral detail is compromised a little bit. So it's a trade-off. And here's what's of interest. This is the distance between pixels for one of these oversampled observations versus the row number. So you take a, an image cube, and then you just follow along the path of the observation that's a particular set of rows, and this is a particular column or sample that we're moving down. And that's zero distance. And this is the red lines represent the actual gimbal motions because we actually in, have encoders on the actuators. So there's jitter. We're moving all over the place. Oh, you know, to a geologist, well, you're messed up. To you guys, engineers, you can use jitter, right? Because you're oversampling, and as long as you can reconstruct the history, then it allows you to do image reconstruction at a finer detail. It's basically in a long uh, track Laplacian, but each pixel needs a, a particular uh, high pass filter. So you can actually sharpen the images down less than 18 meters uh, down to whatever you dare to use uh, as long as you understand what's happening in terms of the photon noise. And to show you what's happening here, here's a crater called Santa Maria. And that little bright halo is the edge of the crater. And then there's basaltic sand, dark material that's blown out. And this is a blow up in which we're following the row in this particular column. And what's going on here, this is a map of longitude and latitude of the pixel locations projected onto the surface. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 are increasing distances but variable distances as we move along the surface. And then, uh-oh, 13 is going backwards. Because of the jitter in the encoder, we actually move backwards. And what's happening is this dark material in the crater 
shows up beyond the actual location because we're moving backwards. So it's moving back into the dark area and putting that pixel uh, onto the next location in terms of the row. As long as we know where the hell these things are, we can use it in terms of image reconstruction to the extent there's overlap. So here's Santa Maria. This is the place we visited over um, winter break, if you will, for the academics. And what's of interest, it's about the size of a football field. And it's relatively new, and you can see blocks that are thrown up. So we wanted to investigate the structure, the morphology of this area. And from oversampled data, what we see is this area is spectrally interesting. It's not been seen before in any place that we've been. So we actually used the CRISM data to have the vehicle drive to this location, and then we spent solar conjunction making, making measurements, long duration measurements with the in situ capabilities. So it's this area that was of interest. And it corresponds to this area code Yuma and right on the other side. By the way, there's Endeavor's rim off in the, on the horizon. This is actually the far side. Uh, that's about uh, 30,000 meters away. And you can't see Cape York and Cape Tri uh, Botany Bay because they're, they're, they don't have much relief. So Lander Point, Cape Tribulation, way off to the side. Lo and behold, doing that reconstruction, one uh, backs out that same mineral signature of Keyserite for that southeast corner. And this was pretty neat in that we used the orbital assets with the sharpening to drive the vehicle to a particular location for surface measurements. And this was the outcrop that um, we stayed on for a couple weeks and made long duration Mossbauer measurements. This is a mess, but this is the only way to explain the compositional data. So these are all the observations of rocks that we've done during the course of the mission for Opportunity, where we're looking at 11 oxides and I think um, 100 some samples. So this is a form of principal components analysis where we're rotating through that hyperdimensional space to find the axes where, when the data are projected, capture the highest fractional variance. So 82% on factor one in terms of the loadings, and 3% or thereabouts on factor two. And what's of interest, if these are normalized in such a way that uh, all these numbers represent observations on a particular Sol or Mars day. The red ones are for natural surfaces. The green ones are for surfaces that are brushed with the rat. And the blue ones are surfaces that have been ground into with the rat. So as we move from right to left, we're going from altered surfaces to fresh surfaces. And what's of interest is if you've got a sample that has its location close to an oxide, like magnesium oxide, what it says is that magnesium is important in terms of determining the unique capabilities. As you move from right to left, you're seeing more of the intrinsic variation in composition. And what's of interest is the sample that we were looking at over the solar conjunction swings around from natural to brushed to ratted with a correlation of magnesium and sulfur. It's probably keyserite. Probably keys right. Unfortunately, mini test doesn't work and did not work over the winter season that we just passed our, our calendar year, so we don't have direct confirmation of this phase. In the meantime, we've been taking oversampled observations for other places, including Victoria, which was the 800 meter crater that we spent a year in uh, making measurements stratigraphically. We're using craters as natural drills. And we did an oversampled observation, and there's a well lit, sunlit portion of the, the um, inner wall, which corresponds to this piece. We didn't get there. We didn't know it was interesting until we left uh, and were long gone. Pull out the, the spectra with this oversampled sharpened observation, and it's the same signature. So we have three places now in which we've seen this, this diagnostic signature. Here's Cape York, here's Botany Bay, here's Cape Tribulation. These are the ancient Nowakian rocks. And what we'll be doing is going to Cape York and Botany Bay. This is a parameter map, and you can see how noisy it is, in which we're looking at the spectral features for hydrated sulfates, just minerals that have water in their lattice, and phyllosilicates. It's largely within 
the large, the massive exposures, this 80 meter high, very wide portion of the, of the rim. Uh, and Cape York is up here. This is the normal set of observations, although there does seem to be some degree of hydration within Botany Bay proper. So we really wanted to do an oversampled observation. This is the first one. And this represents high rise. This is the projected um, normal um, chrism observation. This is a test within the long track oversampled. This is a better test. What's happening when you project these, there's less distance because you're oversampling. So when you do the projection, you're covering a less of a distance. This is a, a tough set of analyses or retrievals to do because you have to worry about what's happening with the noise and estimate the photon noise to boot. So here is Cape York, um, Cape Tribulation, Solander Point, and that's a normal um, observation. This is the long track oversampled. You can see it's kind of stretched out like a worm, and that's because we're oversampling in the long track direction. So we get more samples at 18 meters per pixel along that track. And this is what happens when you project it. Uh, it's less of a distance, um, and you begin to see the features pretty clearly. Here's a high-rise observation of Cape York. It's really interesting. Here's a 12 meter per pixel projection from the new along track oversampled. In this one, we use 3 meters, 6 meters, 12 meters, depending on the degree of oversampling. And you can see that it sharpens it. This instrument will never produce a high-rise quality view. It's not designed for that. It's a hyperspectral imager. But you can begin to pick out ge different geologic provinces. So these are the old rocks. This is a portion of the rim in which we think there are clay minerals exposed. This set of benches may represent the youngest lake beds or sedimentary deposits that we've encountered. We have to cross those in order to get to the old rocks and we'll cross the contact. And then blue represents soil cover, and then kind of light brown to um, tan represents bedrock exposure. So retrieval requires a trade-off. It requires really high fidelity modeling of the atmosphere and the surface and validation. And we're right in the process of doing that. And it's just not ready to show. But the interesting targets are right about here. And it requires using the landed assets opportunity to get there and to take a look at the best place to go to make measurements with the remote sensing and the in situ capabilities. And it's just a shame that we don't have mini tests. And geologically, what's happening, <clears throat> these are the soil covered plains. These are the, the bedrock exposed dominantly plains, Botany Bay. And that's where we see in all the CRISM data evidence for water exposed in the minerals on the surface. And here's the ancient set of rocks. Here are the benches. And these, these iron magnesium clays, if they exist, we think are right about here. So within probably a few weeks, we should be able to, to confirm whether or not we see them here. We certainly see them in Cape Tribulation and help the rover planners with exact locations to drive to to take a look with our landed assets to validate this putative discovery and to characterize the, the materials, the setting, and to understand <coughs> the ancient environment. This is exaggerated three times, Paolo and Ashley, so it's not as bad as it looks, the vertical exaggeration. So this is Cape York seen from the south. You can see the edge of the soil cover, the bedrock exposed, the benches, and the interesting targets are here, and that slope is 10 to 15 degrees relatively high thermal inertia, although we're still working on it. And it's kind of terra incognita in that we haven't seen a place like that in age or thermal inertia or spectral properties before. So we have to toe dip in there uh, and really understand the terrain from the surface views before we get too far in. And that's the topic of a lot of planning and analysis that will go on within the, the next two months before we, we get to that location. So that's kind of a view of remote sensing, but applied very tactically in, in terms of understanding what we're seeing from orbit and from the surface, and a look ahead <coughs> to getting to this new set of targets. And then when I come back this afternoon, I'll talk a little bit about the terra mechanical properties that we've seen with Opportunity, 
and also with spirit. So thanks, folks.